So many surveys of the public found them hesitant to receive the COVID vaccine when it's available. Many factors seem to be playing a role in this, but one often cited reason is the Operation Warp Speed and the development of a vaccine project very quickly compared to other projects in the past. Uh, but I've seen Dr. Francis Collins mention that the speed has been much to do about getting the mRNA vaccination platform up and running because it's been something we've worked on since SARS and MERS. And I just thought what you had to say about that platform since most of the vaccines getting close to approval are of that same platform. Well, okay, so first of all, I have to say that with all due respect to my colleagues, I've never liked the word warp speed. <laughs> it has a connotation of almost reckless speed and it's not. Right. And I think I, you, you kind of hinted at it, Albert, about saying that it's really the advances in platform technology that have allowed us to do things in a matter of months that usually takes literally years to do. So I'll give you an example. There are six or seven platforms that are coming under the Operation Warp Speed umbrella, which means they're being facilitated, developed, and or um, helped out and financed by the federal government. And there are three separate platforms involved in that. You know, one of them is uh, uh, essentially genetic platform as exemplified by mRNA. Other are vectors such as chimp adeno, human adeno, VSV, measles, and then there's the standard recombinant proteins. So to just give you an example of why we feel that A, the speed in no way compromises safety or even scientific integrity, but it doesn't solve the problem that you mentioned that people perceive that we're going so fast that there may be a reluctance to want to get vaccinated. So the Chinese published the sequence of the SARS coronavirus 2 on a public database on January the 10th. I got my team together on the 11th and said, we got to partner with Moderna to develop this in an mRNA platform. By the 15th, that's five days, we started doing it. 65 days later, we were in a phase one trial. And six months later, we were in a phase three, seven months later, we were in a phase three trial. That process normally would take a few years, but we didn't compromise anything. It isn't as if, you know, we injected people and weren't worried about whether or not there's an adverse event or, so now what we have is we have three and very soon we will have four candidates in phase three trial. One of the trials is having 30,000 people in it. Another is having 44,000 people in it. And Janssen, J&J, &J, is gonna have 60,000 people in it. So there's gonna be a lot of uh, end there to look for efficacy, but also a lot of people that are gonna be observed for a considerable period of time for safety. I mean, I was just talking with uh, the uh, person who's running the show for J&J, &J, Paul Stoffels, you know, telling me that there's gonna be two year follow up. And then we're working with the Moderna and the Pfizer people also long term safety follow up. So uh, our challenge is gonna be to reach out to the public, particularly the vulnerable people who should be vaccinated and try and get them enrolled in a clinical trial because we really need uh, what, what I call comparable representativeness of the diversity in the population. We've got to get brown and black people, we've got to get Latino, world, African yeah. American into the trial so that when we show that we have a safe and effective trial and a safe and effective product, that we can say to the minority communities, which are at higher risk, not only of infection, but of the complications and say, we've proven that we got a good vaccine, but we've also proven it that it works in you and not just in white people. 
assessment. That's the problem. So the public perception is important as well. Oh, it's, yeah. it's totally critical, yeah. totally critical.